In this video I'm going to show how to build a pneumatic turbine that can run off a small portable air compressor. In my previous video I machined parts for a steam turbine out of aluminum, but I haven't gotten around to building the boiler for it, so in the meantime I wanted to experiment a little bit with compressed air driven turbines which I could easily make by 3D printing. My initial design was a simple impulse turbine. The nozzle accelerates the high pressure air to a high speed jet and is mounted at an angle so that it hits tangent to the blades. The scooped blade should theoretically bend the airflow and in doing so transfer momentum to the rotor. Here's how it looked after printing. It took a little bit of cleaning up to get the support material off the bottom of the blades, but it looks like it's clean enough to be usable. Next I insert a steel hub so I can reliably fasten the rotor to a shaft to transfer torque. If I tried to do this with a set screw in the PLA, it would probably slip. Seems to spin pretty smooth, so now I'll make a casing for it. The casing is pretty much just a square box with a cavity for the rotor, a small inlet for the nozzle, and a big outlet. Now it's time to CNC the nozzle insert. This will be a little tricky because I have to machine both sides and get the outlet concentric with the inlet. The outlet is a 1 16th hole because, well, that was the smallest drill bit I had. My little compressor can sustain about 50 psi of airflow through that diameter, but I think it would have actually been more efficient to have a smaller diameter hole with a higher pressure. Also, this is really something that should have been done on a lathe, but I don't have a lathe at the moment. After about an hour of very sketchy slot cutting on the CNC, I was the proud owner of this little aluminum nozzle insert. Well, almost. I left a little material behind so that the part didn't snap off my tool when it came out of the block, so I had to drill those bits out and cut it the rest of the way with some snips. I also didn't think ahead when I designed the part because I should have had some flats to hold it in a vise when I tapped it, or at least tapped it before machining it, because cutting threads for a 1 8 NPT required a lot of torque, and I mauled the pretty finish on the part pretty bad in the process. But when everything was said and done, I did have a functioning nozzle insert that I could connect to an air hose, so I guess it was a success. And now I can put everything together. The whole thing spins surprisingly smooth, even with the cheap ball bearings I'm using. I drilled a small dimple into the nozzle insert to accept a set screw. I had to do this because I found that the nozzle would blow itself out of the socket otherwise, even though it had a pretty tight fit. Before I fire it up, there's some modifications I want to make to my compressor. See, when air gets compressed, it gets really hot, even without any friction present. It's just a property of thermodynamics. Because PLA can't really stand up to any sort of heat, I want to cool off the air before it enters the turbine, so I'm going to build a radiator between my compressor's output and the regulator. This is also known as an after cooler. This is also an important component for removing moisture from the air, which will be extremely important for some projects I'm going to be doing in the future. I've basically made a small holding tank for water out of this PVC pipe, which a 25 foot copper coil sits inside of. The compressed air travels through this coil and cools down. In the process, it should also condense a lot of the moisture out of the air, which can be captured before it goes into the tank. This is really helpful for keeping the tank from rusting on the inside, but having dry air is also important for a lot of other applications. This whole process pretty much just involves swapping out fittings and lines, since everything on my compressor used standard plumbing threads. Although, in a few cases, I couldn't get the compression fittings on my copper tubing to seal under pressure, so I just heated them and threw a little bit of solder on the gaps. I probably spent more effort than I really needed to trying to make the whole thing look nice by painting it so that it matched the color of the compressor. It came out looking pretty nice, so now I'll add some coolant water and see how it does.
the good news is it definitely cools off the air before it goes into the tank or regulator, but I'm still getting water in the tank because I don't have a moisture trap. Oh yeah, and this cheap copper seems to be corroding from the Florida tap water. Oh well, it'll work for now. Back to the turbine. That run was at a modest 20 psi, and it seems to be screaming along pretty fast, at least without a load. Let's see what it does at 50 psi. Pretty impressive, but the rotor needs to be balanced better because the vibration was getting pretty bad. I can make loud noises all day, but I'd like to actually get some idea of the power I'm getting from this thing. So I rigged it up to this simple test fixture where it's connected to a DC motor working as a generator. With this I could put various resistive loads on the generator, and by knowing the voltage across them I can calculate the power. Oh yeah, it also has shiny lights. Anyway, let's look at one of those resistive load tests. When used as a generator, the output of a brush DC motor should look something like this. A DC voltage with a certain amount of AC ripple. In theory, the multimeter's DC voltage readout should be giving me the average inside that ripple. So let's see what kind of measurement accuracy $10 at Walmart gets me. After a little bit of amusement from resistors bursting into flames or exploding, I came up with the following graphs for runs at 40 and 50 psi. I used resistors from 1 ohm to 1500 ohms, so the horizontal axis is plotted on a logarithmic scale. Of course, the more relevant metric is power, shown here, which is calculated by the voltage squared over the resistance. This paints a pretty bleak picture, topping out at just under 3 watts at 50 psi, but my suspicion is that the DC motor acting as a generator probably has the same narrow efficiency peak that it does when operating as a motor, so the generator and the turbine are probably going to peak in efficiency at different loads, causing abysmal results if this method is used. The solution is to directly measure mechanical power by measuring both RPM and torque at the same time. I'll accomplish both measurements using a rotor with some magnets. Placing a coil near one set of magnets will allow me to measure the frequency of rotation on a frequency counter or oscilloscope, and another set of magnets spinning near a block of conductive material like copper or aluminum will generate eddy currents and act as an electromagnetic clutch, causing a torque that can be measured with an arm pushing on a scale. This is effectively just a crude dynamometer. I'll start by building my magnetic rotor with the 3D printed hub and some cube magnets, and then I'll mill out the block for the eddy current clutch that the torque arm will be connected to. This could really just be done with any block of aluminum, but I wanted an excuse to use my CNC. Here's the finished block, and the measurement arm attached to it. It'll slide onto an 8mm shaft that's attached to this bearing on a 3D printed bracket that'll sit in front of the magnet rotor. Then I printed this little tray to hold the milligram scale that I'll be using to measure the torque. The purpose of the cone is to ensure the torque arm stays horizontal and pushes on the right spot. If the arm was pointed down, there would be an error proportional to the cosine of the angle, and if it was hitting a wider area, there would be some uncertainty as to what exact point the force was actually acting on. Let's do a quick test to demonstrate the effect of eddy currents. There's about a quarter inch or six millimeter gap between the rotor and the aluminum block. As you can see, even a slow spin of the rotor causes an increase of about half a gram or so. The center of rotation to the end of the arm is 140 millimeters. Now I have the information I need to convert the scale measurement to torque. Next I made the coil for measuring rotation frequency, keeping in mind that since there's two magnets in the sensor portion of the rotor, the frequency on the scope will be double the actual rotation frequency. Here's the completed test fixture, so let's spool it up and see what results I get.
After adjusting the clutch to a bunch of different positions to change the loading, here's the data I got out of the test. This graph shows the torque versus RPM, which actually follows a pretty logical progression. If you think about it, the nozzle jet is going to have the greatest relative velocity, and thereby thrust, when it's hitting a stationary rotor, whereas if the rotor tip speed is the same as the nozzle jet, there won't be any relative velocity, so there won't be any thrust. So it makes sense that the torque would just sort of be a linear progression downward as speed increases. This information, I can produce a power curve, which is shown in red. This particular turbine peaked at 9.7 watts at 9200 RPM. Still very inefficient when you compare it to the power going into the air compressor, but more than three times better than the result given by the electrical test. Oh, by the way, I should mention that all of this data was collected at 50 PSI. That was an interesting experiment, but I want to try a turbine rotor that I could actually machine on my 3-axis CNC, so I designed a new rotor that's effectively just a 2D cutout. I also designed a new aluminum nozzle insert so that it has flats that can be gripped by a wrench or a vise when I'm tapping the big NPT fitting threads. Let's put it together and run the same test to see how it compares to the first turbine. Okay, there was way too much vibration when I spooled that up, and it made the test results look pretty wonky and inconsistent. So I made this jig to balance the rotor. As you can see, even when I rotate it a bit, there's a position it consistently returns to, which is a heavy spot. I'll mark out where the heavy spot is, and then drill a small amount of material out of that area, and see if the rotor still settles in that spot. This isn't a perfect solution because there's quite a bit of static friction in the bearings, but it should be enough to correct any egregious errors. After balancing the rotor, I got a much better result. In fact, to my surprise, the 2D rotor actually outperformed the scooped rotor by more than 60% at 50 PSI. My highest measured power was 16.4 watts compared to 9.7 watts on the previous rotor. My guess is that the geometry forces the pressure to stay in the casing longer and do more work on the rotor, whereas with the scooped rotor it just kind of blew straight out. So overall I think this project was a success, and with some tweaking I think I could 3D print turbines that are powerful enough to actually be useful as tools. So in my next video I'll be looking at different rotor and casing geometries and also trying multiple stages. Thanks for watching.